Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, Fading Memories listeners, and thank you again for choosing us. Today, I have Kim and Mike Barnes. They have a group called Parenting Your Aging Parents and a workbook called The Caregiver's Key. And we're going to be talking today primarily on balancing parenthood, careers, and caring for your aging parents. So thanks for joining me, Mike and Kim. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you so much. So why don't you give us your background? We were chatting before we hit record on how some of this came to be. And Kim has kind of an interesting perspective. So if we could throw that in as well when we're while you're introducing yourselves. Sure. Sure. We're both former uh, broadcasters, TV uh, anchors, news anchors and sports anchors. But the impetus of, of what we started came because my mom has Alzheimer's and it you know, started about 10 years ago or so. And as you know, it's not an overnight type of thing. It just gets worse and worse and worse. And as, as we went through that uh, situation, I guess you could say my sister and I started talking to my dad about moving from the house they lived in about an hour east of Dallas, kind of out in the country mm -hmm. to where they got no interaction with anybody but each other. And my dad doesn't cook. So as my mom couldn't cook anymore, they'd go out to breakfast, come home, go out to lunch, come home, go out to dinner, come home, which was fine, but it would start wearing on my dad. So we said, y'all need to move into independent living. Well, my dad was a little resistant at first. He kind of pictured a nursing home from when my granddad was like that and back in the 80s. He finally did. And ever since then, he's like, son, that's the best move we've ever made. Thank you so much. Well, when they got to independent living, things things were I'd say better for my mom, but it was better for her. But, you know, she didn't improve, but it helped her. But as my mom kept getting worse and worse and worse, and it was even even though my dad didn't have to cook for her, take her to, to eat, it still got so hard on him caring for her 24 seven <laughs> that we approached him again, said, you know, mom's going to have to move to memory care. But you have to be behind this 100 percent because y'all you know, won't be together anymore. It's going to, it's going to be tough. And we realized then as my sister and I went and looked at memory care places, because my dad said, y'all are in charge, whatever <laughs> we need to do. And my, my sister and I looked at four different places and we realized that even though we felt prepared, you know, we had copies of the will and, and power of attorney and medical directive and stuff like that. And we've talked about finances. We, we thought we were prepared. And then we start looking at the memory care places and we felt <laughs> so overwhelmed because we didn't know what to ask, what to look for, what the red flags could be. And I told Kim at the time, I said, I feel like we felt prepared. And if we feel so overwhelmed, then most people should really feel it, mm -hmm. feel like that. So let's see what we can do to help people. And it was interesting because at the very beginning, when he suggested it, I said, oh, this doesn't sound like very fun stuff to talk about, mm -mm. which it's not necessarily. And that's the hard part. And that's why also we found that people don't talk about it. And that's why it can feel so lonely. And after Mike's mom moved to memory care, just the one post that he did on social media about it, what I noticed is not only were people very empathetic, of course, and, you know, in expressing that, but what I, what I really picked up on were all the numbers of people who said, oh my gosh, I've been through that. I I'm in the middle of it, or I see it coming in my future and not just Alzheimer's necessarily, but just that caring for your aging parent. And so at the time I said, you're, you're right. You're right. There are people need a place to have, be able to come together and be able to have that other, per, that, that perspective where they just feel heard and they know other people can relate to that. And my, my background is a little bit different. My dad passed a long time, passed away a long time ago. My mom is single. And so that, add some different challenges because she doesn't have a spouse to be able to bounce ideas off of or, 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 you know, share that caregiving. And what I've realized as well is that while she has some dementia, kind of mixed dementia in early, early stages still. So she's still very independent for the most part, although she lives in independent living, which is a great place for her to be. And she, she really enjoys it. What I realized is that my example of my grandparents who I was very close to lived to be 95 and 98 and never had any cognitive impairment besides just what might happen when you're 95 or 98, you know, that you, you forget a few things here or there, but not that, but not, not what comes with Alzheimer's. And so it's been interesting to see, as I've realized that I didn't, I didn't know what that looked like. And until really you started seeing it with Mike's mom. And then even with my mom having some of the same conversations frequently, 
I found that I get really impatient. And I, and I think that part of that is because I hadn't ever seen that in my grandparents, which are, you know, moms about their, almost their age when I'm thinking about it. And so I just don't, I didn't have that example, which, you know, if unfortunately our, our kids will have that perspective of seeing their grandmother, you know, this happened to their grandmother. It just, it just gives a different perspective. So I don't, you know, it's not necessarily good or bad or either way, but I, but I think I finally realized Mike does such a good job of being very patient and be very, be being very calm. Although he's not talking on the phone, you know, he's not interacting with his mom in the same way where I tend to frankly, just get a little impatient sometimes and almost feel like, well, if you just try a little harder, mom, you'll be able to remember. And, and, and unfortunately sometimes it works and, but most of the time it doesn't. Yeah. Trying hard doesn't, doesn't fix the problem. And you guys hit on something extremely important is we need to have more conversations like you've been having and I have regularly because, you know, when my grandmother who had my maternal grandmother had vascular dementia, I had no idea how to deal with her. Mm -hmm. And there was one day that I was, you know, watching her for lack of a better term. Uh, My mom agreed to, to, basically take care of her mom for the weekend. And then I got roped into an entire day. I'm not sure how that happened. Um, (laughs) It's like, hmm, interesting. And it was, it was fascinating and heartbreaking because in the beginning of the day, my grandmother remembered who I was, Mm -hmm. maybe not super well, you know, maybe not, not all the details, but that's okay. And by the end of the day, she was telling me, well, now don't be rushing into marriage. And I was like, mm, I think I've been married like 13 years, probably late for that. <laughs> you know, the kid is 11. And yeah, I'm like, she must think I'm my cousin. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so it was, it was funny, but it was also kind of, you know, it was, it was kind of a little ding on the heart because I'm the oldest grandchild on both sides. So mm-hmm. my sister and I are we're quite a bit older than the other grandkids Mm -hmm. on my mom's side. So it was kind of like, you know, I'm the special one and you don't remember me. It was just Mm -hmm. like, Mm -hmm. it was tough, but you know, there's the, for lack of a better term, the older generation doesn't understand like the millennials and the younger people. They, they share everything and the older generation shares very little. And I'm in the middle. I, I, I was very careful about what I put of my mom online Mm -hmm. because I knew she'd murder me if I, if I didn't, (laughs) or if I, if I was, you know, there was probably stuff I put online that she would have hated anyway, but you know, I tried to be fairly respectful of her needs, but also trying to show what advanced Alzheimer's looked like because I, you know, even with my grandmother, I mean, I, I had examples of it, but it was just little tastes here and there. Mm -hmm. So it, Mm -hmm. you know, it was kind of like, you know, Kim, I was like, eh, I mm-hmm. don't know how, I don't know how to deal with this. Nobody mm-hmm. taught me how to deal with this, mm-hmm. which is the whole reason I started mm-hmm. the podcast. Cause you can only read so many books. Right. Right. <laughs> there are so many instances when you, you have to laugh just so you don't cry mm-hmm. because th- there are so many times when either my sister who lives a, a couple of miles from where my mom is in memory care. So she visits every week and I try to go up every month or so to visit, but, but one of us visits and my mom doesn't recognize us at first. So we have to kind of remind her who we are. And especially because we go without my dad, because if we go with my dad, it, it can agitate, agitate her yeah. for, for whatever reason, but, but it'll when go they, from, only when they go together. Yeah. It's really interesting, but, but it'll go from it, within 10 minutes. It'll go from, yeah, I can't believe your dad put me here, blah, blah, blah. And she'll be upset. And then 10 minutes later, she'll say, how is your dad? Is he still oh. sick? And oh. then and then a, a few minutes later, it's like, is your dad still alive? I haven't seen him in so long. It's like dad was here two days ago. It was like, and, and again, it, it hurts inside, but you have to almost build up that that wall and just you have to laugh at it in some ways yep. or, or take it a little bit lighter mm-hmm. because otherwise I'll tear you up. Mm-hmm. I had a similar experience. My mom, my mom thought I was her best friend. Although mm, this particular day, I think she thought I was somebody else. I'm not sure, but she got very serious. And she's like, is your mom still living? And it was like, Oh Lord, this is a very strange question. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, it, and it, you know, and of course it comes out of the blue and you're like, Oh, huh? and yeah. you know, so then, it, and then you have to be like a really good actor and think on your feet and be like, Oh yeah, she's doing great. And you know, and then one time she was, 
you know, bemoaning the fact that she hadn't seen her parents in a long time. And I'm thinking, uh, yeah, cause they're dead, but you mm. of course don't remind her of that unless you right. want tears and drama and <laughs> yeah. you know, mm-hmm. other negative emotions. So mm-hmm. I forgot what I said that day, but my, the, the toughest comments mom would make was when she told me that she didn't think her brain worked very well anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's my like, mom has said the same things. Mm-hmm. That's, that I, they must know somehow mm-hmm. like, yeah. Yeah. And she doesn't do it all the time. It's like when she kind of gets some clarity, we like to call it, you know, Swiss cheese. When, when she hits the cheese, she realizes it. When she hits the holes, it's like, mm, she doesn't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. But she just asked my sister a couple of weeks ago, Oh, what's your dad's name? And you know, it's a case of, do you not know who my sister is? Do you not really remember dad? Who do you not remember? Mm-hmm. Somebody should not remember though. And you just, again, you have to take it in the right way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's hard. I wonder if you going with your dad confuses your mom because she's looking at you thinking you're him in her mind, you know, like yeah. wherever she is on the the history spectrum, mm-hmm. oh, you represent of, dad more than of, he represents him. <laughs> that's one of my mom's and we've all figured out that's one of my mom's biggest problems. If you want to call it that is that her, her little brother is seven years younger than her. And she helped raise her little brother. Of course, I'm her only son. And then uh, one of my nephews, my sister's oldest son, she helped raise him for a couple of years after my sister got divorced from her first husband. So So they were really close. Yeah. So she gets all three of us confused. And I I like to tell the story in some speeches that I give that I was sitting in the car with my mom. This was a couple of years ago before uh, in the middle of the first year of COVID before she moved into memory care. I'm sitting in the car with my mom as my dad ran into a store to to grab something. And she asked me a couple of questions. And I realized, again, I've been with her all day, but I realized she doesn't know who I am. She thinks I'm her grandson and not me. And, uh, uh, you know, part of me is like, <laughs> my mom doesn't remember me. This is terrible. But you have to realize mm-hmm. she didn't choose that. You cannot take it personally. <clears throat> the fact that that it's the disease that's causing it, mm-hmm. but it, it helps you understand the disease even more and realize that that she doesn't choose that, but she needs help because of it. Yeah, definitely. So the I'm going to back up a little bit. The assisted living that your parents <laughs> were in. Mm-hmm. Did not have an attached memory care. Taken. No, it was independent living all by itself, which was great for them because, you know, they lived on the second floor. They'd go down to the first floor, three meals a day. Uh, activities. My, my, activities. My mom loved playing bingo every day, even though she didn't remember it a lot of times. But <laughs> She but loved she, to visit with she, everybody. She's, a very, yeah. she's an extrovert. She loved talking to people. But, but I think that advanced her Alzheimer's a little bit. The fact that she was by herself, not getting any interaction except for with my dad and Truth be told, I love my dad, but he spent most of his days up in his second floor study watching the stock market all day because he loves following the stock market. While they were still, while they were still in the farm, yeah, yeah, at their at their house. So my mom was just sitting in front of a TV basically all day doing nothing, Mm -hmm. and she got to where she couldn't. She loved to do crosswords and Sudoku, Mm. couldn't do that anymore. So it really got hard on her, and that's why moving to independent living. Mm -hmm helped both of them so much, but boy, especially during those first few months of COVID when dad was having to do everything. Well, and they were, and they were quarantined to their apartment. Yeah. They were quarantined for a couple months. and couldn't even live their apartment. But even after that, they call all the time. And and because when Alzheimer's first started hitting, my mom kind of got a little paranoid about it, I guess you could say to where if my dad was on the phone, she'd say, who are you talking to? You're, you're you're telling him I'm crazy. You, you stop. It's like, no, he was talking to me about sports or something. It's it's nothing. But because that dad was always on speakerphone. So we'd be talking the first few months of COVID and something would come up about me or Kim or one of their, their grandkids, you know, one of our two kids. And I'd say something about, yeah, Brandon doing such and such, such, such because of COVID. And I'd hear mom in the background going, what's COVID? <laughs> and my dad's like, it's that virus, huh? <laughs> over and over and over, over, and, and, over. over. and that's just when I'm on the phone. So I know it happens so much to my dad and my dad has the patience of a saint, but even when that happens, Mm -hmm. you know, it wears on you and wears on you and wears on you. And I could see it draining the life out of him. Mm -hmm. And that's what scared my sister and me. And that's why we really thought that we've got to take care of mom and him Mm -hmm. because if not, we're going to lose them both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's kind of what happened to us. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why though, when there were, there were definitely discussions about when it was time to move Graham was okay. That means I'll have to be in different build, you know, mm-hmm. different places. Mm-hmm. 
do we move his, you know, do they move to a place that has the continuum of care? Yeah. But he was so comfortable where he was. You know, that's where it just gets tricky trying to decide. And for the most part, for most places, and you may know some place that's different, but for what we looked into, most places, mom would have still, even if they were in the same building or oh, complex, sure. mom would be in a different room. So right. it's still like they're living apart. Mm-hmm. So because of, so because of that, we thought, you know, and, and dad loves the place he's in. They call him the mayor there because he knows everybody. He's always talking to everybody, runs the place practically. And, but, but because of that, it's like, you know, and dad admitted, I, I don't really want to leave here because I love it here. Right. I He'd like have to meet all new people. And, yeah. And be so, in a new situation. so, you know, he's only a mile and a half away. He he still drives so he can go see her, you know, when he wants to. And it, it helps tremendously. And he calls me every time he visits after he visits mom. And he always says, you know, how, how was the visit? Oh, it was good. You know, you, you and Diane picked a great place. Mom is in such a great place. I am so glad where we picked. It. It's like, oh, I'm you know, I'm so glad because mm-hmm. it's been tough on him. Mm-hmm. It's tough. Oh, They've sure. been married 62 years and they've been apart now for what 14 months. Mm-hmm. And that's not easy. It's not easy at all. But 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 he realizes it's best not only for her, but also for him. And he's really grown in the ability to be able mm-hmm. to manage it yes. as far as having to learn some of those techniques of the redirection. And, you know, I love that Mike's sister has the greatest uh, technique because she can take a, a knitting or yarn because Mike's mom lo- was so handy and knitted and crocheted and all of that. And so if she gets a little agitated, she'll just say, Hey, can you help me? Fi- I've got a knot here or I've got a, I've dropped a, a stitch. Help, can you help me? Help me straighten my yarn up, mom. Yeah. And, and she mom just, suddenly is in mom mode. It's just here, let's do this. Let's do this. And forgets all about whatever she was griping about. Mm-hmm. It's it's masterful. My, you know, my, then, my sister really figured it out. And my dad kind of followed suit. Of course, he doesn't knit or yarn, <laughs> you know, use yarn at all, but he takes pictures. So he'll, he'll have a, you know, have a little picture to where if she gets upset, it's like, oh, look, look at your grandson and look at this, look at this picture. And it just stops everything. And she's like, oh, and they start talking about that. Mm-hmm. And it helps her. She doesn't remember things. She has to ask questions. And, and my dad fills her in about, oh, yeah, that's Mike's son. He He's, he's at A&M or that's Mike's daughter. She's at UT or whatever it was. But it helps both of them connect. And, and my dad always says, my mom says, how old are we now? <laughs> I'm, I, I'm 84 and you're 82. So Really? I thought we were in our 60s. Well, wow. we, we sure do look good, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> like, All right, mom. That's what you think. That's great. That's great. See, that's awesome. We should I should do an interview with your dad because one of my soapboxes, for lack of a better term, is is helping people understand that assisted living is not someplace you go park your butt on the couch and wait to die. Obviously, your dad being the mayor of his place is wonderful. I think my dad might've been the same way, Yeah, uh-huh. but you know, he has probably improved his quality of life and his cognitive abilities just by everything that you just described, because, you know, he's more social, he's learned new techniques, yep. you know, just, He's doing it all right. So, (laughs) well, and that was one of the big reasons why I really, really, really encouraged my mom to consider moving into independent living was because she loves getting to go play bridge and do and be involved in things. And she had eye surgery a couple of years ago. That was part. She couldn't drive for a while because of that. And then after that, we weren't really comfortable with her driving anymore either. So she wasn't driving. So she's sitting in her house by herself and she was able to use Lyft for a little while and be able to, you know, be able to get to the places. But then that became a little bit more trouble. And so I just said, I played to the to I appealed to the fact of wouldn't it be great to not have to worry about any home repairs, have to worry about if the if you've got a water leak, having to maintain the grass, you don't have to cook, you don't have to pay, you know, with the car, we tried to yeah, appeal to the no car insurance, no gas and all of that and kind of worked, but she still relented at, at the end. But, but, but for her, you know, there's bridge, every, there, they play dominoes every day at three, there's exercise at 1130, you know, so the, that routine, I think is, gives her things to look forward to every day rather than just, okay, I'm home and I don't want to have to call 
a ride share today, or I don't have somebody who can come pick me up. And so I guess that means I'm stuck here at home, which really gets lonely yeah. mm-hmm. unless you're somebody who just really loves your alone time, I guess. Mm-hmm. I don't know what, I don't know what you'll do, but <laughs> he, he really loves his alone time. So he doesn't necessarily want to be super social. That'll be really interesting. What I'm, but, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Uh, but I think that that was, that was what has been really good for my mom too, I think is the fact that there are activities and there are people to talk to and 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 people to be with, which makes it, I think makes the days much more enjoyable. Yeah. There's options, which is good. Cause I'm like Mike, I, I like to socialize, but when my social battery is drained, it's like, this has been a very nice visit. Thank you for coming. Now, please leave. <laughs> <laughs> I don't right. actually ever say that, but I don't know, think he invites them in. I'm, I think right, that's, I'm yeah. right with you, Jennifer. Yeah. I'm right yeah, with yeah, you. Yeah, know, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. Oh, look at the time, time for you to go. And, in an assisted living, Mike and I could be like, yeah, I don't want to deal with any of these fools today. I'm just going to stay here and read my book or uh-huh. do right. my crafts or whatever Mike likes to do. Or, you know, but then you get to the point where you're like, man, I'm starting to feel like a house plant. Maybe I should go deal with other humans. Mm-hmm. Or somebody's have... going to fix a meal for me. So mm-hmm. I'll, I'm going to go out and look, a meal that somebody else cooked is almost always better, you know? So it's always Definitely. nice when somebody else is fixing. Well, the, where my mom was at, they had the best food. And we went, I did a, the very first year she was there, they had a family like Thanksgiving brunch. They didn't call it Thanksgiving, but that's basically what it was. And the food was amazing. And it was like low salt. Hmm. And I'm like, really? Because I usually kind of, except for regular restaurant food, but I usually feel like things need a little, you know, a few grains of salt to bring out the flavor Mm-hmm. And it was amazing. And their desserts were really good, but they were all portion <laughs> controlled. Uh-huh. Whenever I would take mom, one of our last really good visits before she passed away, I finally learned from guests to just keep my visits shorter, you know, cause I resisted because I was being stupid personally, <laughs> but I picked my mo- mom up, put her in my car, drove her around the building to the assisted living main entrance Mm -hmm. And we went into the dining room and had this beautiful lunch. And, you know, it was like, it's so nice because it wasn't like this giant plate of food that I felt like I needed to eat most of it because, you know, we're taught not to waste food. (laughs) And it was just this really nice visit. And it's like really good food. So, Mm -hmm. you know, my dad was a lousy cook. So, (laughs) you know, the fact that he resisted adult daycare, my sister and I helping anything that would have, you know, helped him. Mm-hmm. still baffles me. Mm-hmm. So, but you were talking about, you had a perfect segue. Oh, about how you convinced her not mm-hmm. to deal with your, you hit all my talking points, you know, mm-hmm. dealing with home repairs and maintenance and cooking mm-hmm. and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Like my husband is um, on, well, he's now on a little scooter. He can't put weight on one foot because he's got a, a wound that needs, can't put weight mm-hmm. on it so it can heal. Oh, wow. So I'm like, and the gal that was cleaning our house, wasn't doing a great job. So I'm like, okay, this afternoon, I guess I get to go vacuum the house. <laughs> so it's like, mm-hmm. okay, as long as I don't have to do it too often, it's okay. Mm-hmm. But and, and we have two golden retrievers, so we really oh, should vacuum yeah. Yeah. far more often than we do. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, you know, the one of the problems a lot of people have is they, they put it, you know, pa- like Kim's mom starts having – issues but is still mostly independent but okay you don't want her to drive so now you're driving her all over the place and you know the next thing you know you're doing so much you're like i've got kids i've got this career Mm -hmm. now i'm taking care of mom you know how did you guys learn to and how do you advise your group followers that sounds cultish but i guess that's (laughs) still the right term how do you advise them to maybe a either avoid getting into that sinkhole of, of doing everything for everybody or getting out of it. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. I started using a product that all you caregivers need to try. I started taking AG1 from Athletic Greens after my workouts because I needed a quick and healthy way to refuel my body. While there are lots of options, most don't taste great, and I don't eat or drink things that don't taste good. So what is AG1? Well, with one delicious, mildly tropical flavored scoop, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins and minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, 
probiotics, and adaptogens to fuel you for your crazy day ahead. AG1 helps support mental clarity throughout the day and you know how important brain health is to this gal. It has over 7,000 five-star reviews and costs less than $3 a day. And you know your time is worth more than three bucks. Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine to recover. I'm sure you're aware that there may be a connection between poor gut health and dementia, so this is another way to help protect your brain. As caregivers to someone with a cognitive impairment, this is also an excellent way to get much needed nutrition into someone who is slowly losing the ability to eat. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D, which is also important for brain health, and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash emerging. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash emerging to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now back to our conversation. I will share first, my mom lives in a different city. So we actually both live in different cities from our parents. We both live that both of our parents live in the city with where our sibling lives. Yeah. Uh, so I think that so that's been, so, so I am not, now I am making trips to go. I went a couple of weeks ago and it was a matter of, okay, I'm gonna take you to a baby shower on Sunday. Let's schedule a doctor's appointment on Monday. Let's get you some new clothes. You know, so we tried to squeeze in as much as we could while we were there. <clears throat> so I do a lot of, I'd say more coordinating of, oh gosh, she called me yesterday. She said, oh yeah, I was just checking on my doctor's appointment, confirming my appointment for October. And I said, October, what are you going for? Well, I don't know. I guess it's just a regular eye exam. And I said, no, are you sure? So now I know I need to call the doctor because I'm not really sure why she's supposed to go back in October. And is that because she hasn't had her regular eye exam yet because she just went in for a different one? You know, just so it's just trying to manage which one have you done and what's next and and, and those kinds of things. So I do a lot of, I guess, managing of her appointments and fielding technology calls and checking her email so that she doesn't get scammed again. We've had some issues with scams, which has been a little bit scary. And also we, because of some issues have taken the checkbook away. So I answer a lot of questions about why don't I have a checkbook again? You know, the, and that kind of thing and trying to, trying to, I do a lot of, uh, spend a lot of time just keeping her at ease, I think. Yeah. I think one of the, the biggest things that, that we have to do is kind of budget our time, mm -hmm. you know, whether you live in the same city or, or not. True. You know, like for me, I try to go up again once a month or so to, to see mom and dad. That means that whole day is shot. I leave early in the morning. I come home late at night. And so he's I, crazy because he drives mm -hmm. up and back in the same day. Yeah, because that means I can't do anything that day. So, you know, that day is, you know, out as far as for anything for work. business wise, work wise, whatever it is that I need to do. Uh, so you have to plan accordingly for that. But a lot of it comes from, I think, how we grew up and, and what we saw our parents do. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw my mom because my mom grew up in West Texas. So her mom, her dad passed away early, but her mom still lived out in West Texas as we were growing up in the Dallas area. So I knew mom would, you know, plan around, okay, we need to go see May, you know, next month and do X, Y, and Z. My dad, my grandfather lived in the same city. So because of that, after he had a stroke back around 1980, my dad really took care of him, but it was, it was a case of, okay, let's go see granddad tonight. So we would drive mm -hmm. the 20 minutes to go check on granddad. Every weekend we would go usually pick him up and bring him to our house. So 40 minute or so round trip to go pick him up and get him, but it didn't wipe up out the whole day, but I still saw how my dad went out mm -hmm. of his way, taking care of his, his dad. So what you see as you're growing up is kind of what you're used to. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what you're, oh, well, you know, that doesn't, that, that makes sense to me as opposed to, you know, if you've never seen that, if, if, you know, like, like Kim's mm -hmm. grandparents were, were so healthy or, or weren't in the same city, you know, one of the two that he, she never saw her mom having to take care of them. Yeah. I would hear about it. Yeah. Some, but I wasn't actually, watching but it, it. it wasn't a daily process because they, they, they were in good health and lived to, mm -hmm. to into their nineties. So because of that, you, you've got to kind of pay attention to what, what you're doing and, and, and kind of learn from your parents, but also see what other people are doing mm -hmm. and realize that there are other ways to do things that, that depending on 
your financial constraints or your family dynamics or your work or, or the medical problems of mm-hmm. your parents that you may have to do something a little bit different. So that's the biggest thing is you have to be flexible. Mm-hmm. You have to understand that that there's more than one way to do things, <laughs> taking care of those parents. I'm just kind of laughing because <clears throat> actually in the next month, I need to move my mom and my daughter. And oh, so we're trying to coordinate because <clears throat> the ideal time to move my mom is actually the time I'm going to be in, you know, in New York helping move my daughter but we need to move mom in this little short window. And I'm trying to figure out, oh, okay, so how are we going to do that? How am I also going to go early and help her? Because we need to purge some stuff. She's moving to a new independent living. And so we need to, you know, we pared down a ton, obviously, from moving from a house to independent living. Not but moving, again. But moving again, there's just a lot of stuff that's never even been used. So there's no sense in packing it up and moving it. So I'm trying to think in the next three weeks, I've got to figure out, we have some big work projects that are going on right now. And I've got to probably find time to go help her downsize or purge a little bit. Because even today she's calling me, she says, should I throw away these pictures? And I'm like, no, 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 just wait, 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 wait. Let's, let's yeah, wait. Not the photographs. <laughs> yeah, not the photographs. She's like, well, I have this box. I have a lot of them. I was like, I know, just hang on. Uh, so I need to figure that out. And we're trying to coordinate to you know, figure out how to, how do you fly and take all of your stuff to New York? So I think, and oh, by the way, get a little work done. So I think the challenge is that that is reality. And we see so many in our group who actually have even younger children where they, I can't imagine if my kids were still in elementary school or middle school where you are still carpooling and taking them places. We, our process kind of started, I would say when our kids were high school Mm age-ish. We've also, we've also tried to include them a little bit. Uh, Our son is often the tech advisor for uh, Mike's dad, because yeah, it's when, just a when, good way. When my dad calls because there's something wrong with the iPhone or he can't figure out something with the Wi-Fi printer or something like that, often I'll help. But sometimes if, if my son's here and he's 25 now, but if he's around the house because he's visiting us, it's like, here, hold on, dad, let me let you talk to Brandon <laughs> and, and he'll take over <laughs> and, and, it, and they'll talk him through it. And it's yeah. just it's just great to see mm-hmm. and great to see them you know, having a, a hand in taking care of their grandparents. But it is that challenge of how do you, in one minute, you're feeling a call trying to help find an apartment for daughter. The other minute, you're trying to coordinate an assessment at a retirement community for mom and in the middle of meetings and all of that. And so I think that the challenge, and, and I'm I'm kind of sometimes the, what's the crisis at hand? Uh, so I'm not necessarily always the best for boundaries and uh, management of that. But I think that's one of the things we, we hear people talking about in the group all the time mm-hmm. and frankly, encouraging each other, because there are so many people who are doing hands-on caregiving where they have the parent living with them. And man, that's tough. It is really tough when, when you almost, and I think that sometimes I think people feel like they need permission to say, you need to take a day off. You need to find somebody to come in and help even for a whole day or even maybe just for a couple of hours mm-hmm. because you're going to burn yourself out yeah. and that's not going to be healthy either. We we knew with Mike's dad, if <clears throat> Mike Mike's dad wasn't taking good care of himself and wore himself out, well, that didn't do any help for his mom. Mm-hmm. And and so I think people often forget that if you're not taking care of yourself as the caregiver, well, you're not as you can't be as help as much help to the person who needs your help. Again, in so many ways, we compare it to to having kids. You know, when when, when you have a baby, especially your first baby, you have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> you know, we did. We sure didn't. You know, 25 years ago, we had we didn't know what we were doing with the first baby. It's like, oh, change the diaper. Okay. They're crying in the night. What do we do? That we're trying to get them to walk, trying to get them to do. We, you don't know, but so many people around you try to help. You know, friends, neighbors, relatives. Everyone has some advice. When you have aging parents, no one talks about it. So you need you have to go outside and try to find that advice, even may, even though maybe bad news or nothing fun to talk about, whether it's Alzheimer's, incontinence, pacemakers, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. You know, talk about it because it's going to help you for one. But also, you have to plan ahead because I like to compare it to. When you have your child, when when they're going to graduate from high school and go to college, it's not like you wait until the day after graduation. It's like, okay, okay. yeah, now what? Well, now what, now what, now what, you, you want to go to college? How much money is that going to cost? Oh, really? Okay. Do you need to take any tests or anything? Okay, well, let's try and take. No, you start planning ahead of time. You start saving money when they're born, practically. Hopefully, hopefully, if you're, if you're yeah. all smart about it. But you, you start planning as you know. That's the you know people gripe about. It, but that's one thing in the school system is that they start doing the stuff that they need to do as far as taking a test, getting prepared, finding out what their major is going to be, getting into, you know, taking the SAT, getting into the college. So they do it all ahead of time to where it's a long process and they're ready for it. 
we don't do that with our mm-hmm. parents. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't no. think about it. Think about it that way. So again, planning ahead so that you're ready for everything at least a little bit. When that crisis hits, it's still going to be a crisis. But if you're ready with some of the other mm-hmm. things in hand, it's going to help a lot. And then after that crisis hits, you mentioned about you know having a little bit of time off when you're taking care of your parents all the time. Why do you think they have Mother's Day out? When you have a baby, it's because those mothers, I know firsthand from, from having two kids with her, it is tough being a mom to little, little kids. And you, you mm-hmm. need to have that time away every once in a while, just an hour or two while, while they're at Mother's Day Out. Well, it's the same thing with aging parents. If you're taking care of them 24-7, you are wearing yourself out. You've, you've got to find some way depending on what your financial situation is, some way to take a little bit of a break. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe it's only an hour or two a day. Maybe it's one day a week. You know, we have uh, one group of family in our in our group to where three of the kids kind of rotate who's taking care of mom and dad every day. Just find some way to get some relief because otherwise you're going to send yourself to an early grave. And, and who wants to do that? Are you guys familiar with the statistic that 65% of caregivers are hospitalized or die before the person they're caring for dies. Wow. And that actually includes younger caregivers, not <laughs> just yeah. folks your age. I'm probably a little older. Mm-hmm. Not a lot because my daughter's 30. Um, but, you know, when somebody told me, you know, that <clears throat> the, the millennial caregivers, because they're so slammed between careers and children and parents, you know, they're having heart attacks and strokes mm-hmm. or panic attacks. And it's like, Yep. Uh, hello, yeah. we need to fix this stuff pronto because yeah. I'm getting I, I, I old. I don't doubt that. Yeah, I don't doubt that because it is, we do see, I, I'm shocked by the number of people who are in our group who are younger than the than what we think of typically being when we're in this stage. And I, I, like I said before, I can't imagine if I still had kids in elementary school or even younger managing this. And so it is super stressful. I'm working full time. I'm caring for little kids who need my attention and and, and want my attention mm-hmm. as well as parents who have a lot of needs as well. And so it's, it's really hard. Yeah. And, and one thing that I think is interesting as far as, well, the fact that we have to, we need to have these conversations one with each other so that we realize that other people are going through similar things and we can glean insight from them, from their experiences. And sometimes it just feels better to vent a little bit or even just share an experience. Hey, here's, you know, it makes me feel so helpful to be able to say, oh, your mom's been scanned. Okay, great. Here are some things that we did after that happened to be able to hopefully keep it from happening again. Maybe something I did might help you. That just makes you, that just makes you feel really good. Well, you you can learn stuff from that too. One of my best friends, uh, his dad had Alzheimer's and he was, I guess you say a stage ahead of my mom. mm -hmm. So when my mom was in stage five, he was in stage six and we talked about it and, and, you know, kind of compared notes and, and just visited about it. And he would tell me what to expect. Mm-hmm. So it didn't surprise me as my mom went into stage six and his dad went to stage seven. And mm-hmm. when his dad passed away last year, we talked about it a lot and about, you know, how, how tough it was and yet how comforting it was in some ways, because seeing, seeing dad, you know, die peacefully and, and what it was like for the family and, and that type of thing. And it's just, you, you need to communicate with others. It doesn't have to be your best friend, but communicate with others about what you're going through because mm-hmm. we have so many people, so many people in our group who say they feel so alone mm-hmm. because they don't talk about it mm-hmm. and they don't, they don't can't find anybody to talk about it. And that's what our group does is that it lets you go on, whether it's asking a question about how do I handle this or just venting. You know, we've had one lady who came on and said, my mom and dad are living with me now. And mom gripes about how the house is a wreck and she can't stand how the way I don't keep the house clean. And I just have to vent because I'm, I'm mad at her right now. <laughs> it's like, she's not looking for any help. She just has to say, ah, I'm yeah. so tired of this, you know? And one of the things that I really hope we can change, and I don't think it'll change fast enough, but assisted living and memory care should not be only for people who have significant economic light, not liabilities. That's the wrong word, but assets. There we go. Oh, yeah, Right. Um, because like my mom, there's no way I knew my mom and I would, one of us would be dead by the end of a week. Mm-hmm. And my dog hated her dog. I have, I had three at the time and the dog that was literally mm-hmm. my appendage. <laughs> mm-hmm. He hated her. And mm-hmm. you know, I got golden retrievers. They love everything. Oh, no. you know, they want to play with every dog that comes by. So for them to not like somebody else's dog is telling <laughs> of the other dog. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I just knew I'm like, 
no, this is not the right choice. Mm-hmm. And my, you know, and I worked from home. I had my photography business attached to our home. I was like, I can't deal with her and clients and, you know, my own stuff. It's, you know, some of it was selfish. I'm like, no, I'm mm-hmm. not doing this. And while you guys were talking, you were, you were mentioning how, you know, Kim didn't observe her mom caring for her grandparents because that wasn't necessary. My maternal grandfather passed away from bone cancer and he was three hours away. So my mom would drive down. Mm-hmm. She's the oldest of four siblings and help care for him while he was on hospice. So she would get mentally stressed before she left. We had a business together. So that was always thrilling. Then she'd be gone for about five days and then she'd drive home and literally be useless for two or three days. She'd like come right back to work because she like needed to be, she needed like some kind of reality Sure. And something other than a dying parent, which I can completely relate to. But I I saw like all the negative, like she's taking care of him. She's dealing with, you know, like they were afraid to give him more morphine for pain because he might get addicted. I'm like, maybe if he lives from this cancer that's killing him, then we can address that fact, that problem. But mm. chances are he's not going to live. So maybe we should just make him more comfortable. It was yeah. so frustrating. And dealing with her was frustrating. It was just like, yikes. So I didn't have any like really super positive. My Mm. mom taking care of her parents and my dad was worse. My Mm. paternal grandmother lived to be 103. Wow. My aunt, she had her mind was fine all the way almost to the total end. My aunt ended up taking care of her a lot because my Nana had glaucoma and couldn't drive Mm. and would not use a taxi or ride share or dial a ride or any of the other mm-hmm. options. No family had to do for family. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and it's, it's unfortunate because my aunt and uncle are prevented from moving to Idaho where their old youngest daughter and four granddaughters are mm-hmm. because his health isn't good enough, mm-hmm. which just makes me want to like scream at the world because you know, here they are giving, giving, giving to his mom. Mm-hmm. And, you know, their reward is, oh, well, too bad. And that just makes me nuts. But it's just interesting that all of my caregiving examples have not been not been great. So now I'm feeling even better that I, I, I took my mom out to watch children. I did everything I could to give her joy and the best quality of life possible. So I'm going to give myself a little pat on the back. There you go. Well, and one of the things that I think I've noticed as well is that, you know, there are definitely people that want their parents to come live with them because they want them to come live with them. And they they want to be the ones that take care of them. And they, whether it's cultural, just the family dynamics that are in your family that, that make you want to do that. And then there are others that feel it more of a sense of obligation, because their parents don't have the financial resources to have other, to have choices. And so they're living with them. And maybe it was a, we've had several situations where it was a tough, it was a tough environment growing up in. And what's interesting when you, when all those family dynamics, birth order, personalities, unfortunately, it seems from what we, what we're witnessing is that a lot of times if there was a rough upbringing, it's a, it's rough on this end too. And so the relationship has been strained and yet then you have these feelings of guilt and, you know, that I need to take care of them because they need me and all of this. And so we've had, there's been lots of discussions in in the group about boundaries and things like that. But then I think on the flip side, there's also the, the, I, I compare this to when you hear the kid screaming in the grocery store and before you have children, you look at that person, you think, Oh my gosh, my kids would never do that. I can't believe. (laughs) And then, then, you know, then I'm in the grocery store line holding my son like a football because he is screaming his head off. And I'm, and I'm saying, you're not winning. We are not leaving this store until we cash through. We go, we, we go through the cash line because I'm not coming back and doing this again. And I just, you know, and so once you've done that and you realize, hmm, okay, I'm sure that people are thinking what a crazy lady, but I just said, we did the shopping and we got it and we are this close to getting out. So we're, we're, I'm not leaving my cart and coming back all that to say, I think that it's easy for us to judge another situation when we're not in it. And I think that can also be true with our parents, because there are some people that would say, I would never put my 
let my parent live with somebody if they weren't in their house, except for me. And then there's other people that would say, you know, so I think that's where we have to all be so careful of not judging others because we don't know, we don't know the backstory, you know, like you knew for your situation that because of your personalities, that it would not be a good, healthy environment. And so you knew how to set those boundaries. I think, unfortunately, a lot of people don't, or they just think, well, gosh, it's not hard for me. Why would it be hard for you? And that's where we do. We have to all kind of be really mindful of that. We don't know what's really going on in that situation or what their upbringing was or what the other circumstances are. So what people choose, we just need to support each other and, and and really how can we make the best of that situation? You know, every family has a different set of dynamics. Those dynamics are strong mm-hmm. and it's hard to, and it's hard to change them. Mm-hmm. I mean, every once in a while, you'll see a little bit of change, but it's hard to change those family dynamics and they're completely different. My family, completely different from, from Kim's. Mm-hmm. You know, we operate in different ways. We connect, connect in different ways. We communicate in different mm-hmm. ways. I mean, we have good families, but we're still, we're different. Mm-hmm. And so you can't compare and we can't, oh, well, we do this. I can't believe you don't do right, this. Right. You, you can't do it that way that easily. And that's why, again, you have to have an open mind about things and see what's best for you, mm-hmm. your family dynamics, the financial situation, the medical situation and everything mm-hmm. and make sure it's best for mm-hmm. everyone. And get those different perspectives, I think can yeah. help because then maybe you find somebody that has a situation that's more like yours where, you know, we feel like we don't have, all, we, I know know we don't have all the answers uh, for all of the different situations because every situation is just a little bit different. Even though, you know, somebody else has a single mom who's, you know, in a city where they're sibling or whatever it is, it's still just a little bit different. So that's why we love being able to bring in experts to come speak to our group. We love to be able to have the interaction within the Facebook community, because again, you might just get that little tidbit because of something that Mike's family did that, might work for me, but might not. But then something that somebody else's family do, um, did that little that little nugget is is great for our situation. Right. So you just have to kind of keep that open mind and keep those conversations going and be know that there's not just one way that works for every situation because everyone's everyone is different. Well, one way may work for your situation today mm-hmm. and not tomorrow either. Sure. That's yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So we. So I think. Oh, go ahead. I'm amazed because I'm rapidly approaching 300 episodes and you think like, how many different ways can you talk about the same thing? And it's always different. It's always different. And I'm, right. I'm still learning. I mean, there's times I say, man, I really wish I'd known this stuff when mom was alive. <laughs> maybe even yeah. when my dad was alive because, mm-hmm. you know, I could have been such a better caregiver. But of course, a decade ago, people didn't talk about it like they do mm-hmm. now. Social media yeah. was still newer. Mm-hmm. You know, the millennials mm-hmm. were still in school. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it was just, it's a whole different, you know, it's a whole different decade and different, oh, you know, wow. life keeps moving on. Yeah. But the one, the biggest challenge that I had was basically, and I don't know how I managed this, maybe just Henri, cause that's kind of a family trait, <laughs> <laughs> but it was like, I kind of felt like, um, I was not going to allow mom or my dad or my Nana or the medical profession or the care home mom was in to basically dominate my life. I always felt that I was the captain of mom's care team and the caregivers in mom's care home. You know, we were all teamed together. I was in charge, but you know, they ran some plays too, and I'm not a football mm-hmm. person. So that's an, ex- that's right, right. She's, she's doing okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, wow, cast, I don't know yeah. where that came from, <laughs> but you know, and when they said mom needs X, I would get X. I didn't, you know, and it was frustrating. Occasionally I'd bring mom back after a visit of watching children in the park and they'd be like, oh, your mom needs X, Y, Z. And it's like, if you had just told me that an hour and a half ago, as I, I was, we were leaving we could have gotten it on the way back because now I got to go get it and bring it back to you without mom seeing me, but it's okay. You know, it's like, we'll, we'll make it work. But, and I just, I did not allow other people to just suck up my whole life. And I don't, I'm going to have to dwell on how I manage that. Like I said, it had to be just because I'm, you know, family trait of Henri, but one of the things, and Maybe, I don't know if you guys can address this, but the, one of the biggest challenges, I think, younger caregivers who are trying to balance everything have issues with is, is their careers. Like, how do you tell your employer, 
yeah, my mom has called five times. It's not a big deal. She's got Alzheimer's or whatever. How do we make the rest of society understand that this is just something we're all going to have to deal with and it doesn't make us lesser employees or less focused or less um, dedicated to our careers if we're taking a few minutes to deal with. I mean, they don't, so I've always been self-employed, so I'm not, I'm not really good. To, but they, they seem to be, you know, leaning a little bit with moms and kids. Exactly. How do we, mm-hmm. how do right. we get that for the other end of the generation? Yeah. Well, that's actually something that we're working on is trying to be able to go yeah. into companies and talk to employers. And we have a, a speaking engagement this week that's with some uh, leaders in our community to, to, to bring to. So first, I think it's talking about the issue mm-hmm. and addressing it, because yep. I think what's interesting is that we don't talk about it because we don't necessarily think that other people are going through the same thing. And yet, if you're in a room of people and you just said, hey, what's your situation? Almost everyone could relate, whether it's currently with their with their parents or, or perhaps what they saw with their grandparents. And so everybody has a story. Yeah. And yet we just don't, we just don't think to say it because it's not happy stuff. It's not like when we have little kids and we're so excited to share, oh, they're walking now or look at them riding a bike. On this other end, it's, it's hard because it's not. Oh, hey, mom fell and mom got diagnosed with Parkinson's or you know, they're just not they're not joyful things to share. And the other thing that I've discovered or kind of noticed is that with children, we have ex, you know developmental expectations that at certain ages, things should be happening. You know, if they're not walking by four, you might be a little concerned, you know, I mean, things <laughs> like that or two, yeah, or two. But, you know, there are certain things that you expect to see at certain ages. Well, especially with an employer, you know, that Kids five, they're going to be going to kindergarten. You know, mm-hmm. the kids uh, eleven, they're in junior high. The kids mm-hmm. sixteen, it's getting a car time and they're mm-hmm. driving. You know, different things at different ages. Absolutely, and yet when it's with our parents, there isn't necessarily a. There aren't those expectations. Just because my mom turns sixty doesn't mean really anything. When she turns sixty five, it just means she can qualify for Medicare, but that doesn't mean that she necessarily needs it even yet. You know, my my grandparents played golf until they were almost 90. And yet then you can have, we have somebody in our group who has a 54 year old mom with early onset Alzheimer's that, you know, that's a whole different. So there's a almost 30 year gap. And so just because I'm 40, my parents should be this, or just because I'm 45 or 50, my parents should be this. And so I think that's where it gets really tricky because you just don't know when it's going to happen. And so if you've got a, you know, a millennial who's 30, you think, oh, they're fine. Well, they very well could have a very sick parent where my parent who's in her eighties is fine. You know what I mean? So I think that's the biggest thing for employers to be aware of is that there's just not that expectation. So I think that what we'd love to be able to help uh, people be be sort of ready for is how can you be prepared so that one, when something does happen, you've got all the information together and you've had those conversations with your parent and you know that information as well as helping them be aware that you know, this is kind of happening. And I think a lot of people, I just put together a proposal the other day for a speaking engagement and was doing a little research. And, you know, there was a study that showed that so many people don't even think their, their manager knows what they're going through because they're afraid to say anything because they don't want them to think that they're not getting their work done. They're not getting the focus in Mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So being able to make it a more normal conversation, like when we have children, I think could help us all one realize that some of our other employees, you know, our fellow employees, our colleagues are going through the same thing. And can we help each other as well Well, as, you know, it doesn't mean that just because I have to step out and take a quick call because my mom called, it's going to be really short, you know, it'll be done fast. But a lot of it's thinking out of the box to me. Think about if a big employer, if they sponsored, however you want to describe it, sponsored the fact that with your parents, that they would help you get a will, power of attorney, medical directive, HIPAA release, all these things to where when that crisis happened, and you know, it's going to happen someday, but when that crisis happened, you're prepared. Now you're still going to have a crisis, but if you have all those things in place, it's going to be much easier on me as the employee employee, Mm -hmm. because I won't have to worry about it nearly as much. Yes. I'm still going to have a problem with mom or dad, whichever one is sick, but I'm not going to have be running around like 
chicken with my head cut off, trying to figure out, oh my gosh, what do I do? I don't have a power of attorney. How am I going to handle their their medical stuff? How am I going to handle their bills? I, I don't know what to do. And suddenly I'm taking off a week mm -hmm. as opposed to, I just need to take a couple of, of hours off mm -hmm. to get things set up for mm -hmm. mom or dad in the hospital. Okay. Now I'm back to work and I can focus on my job more, but you don't, Think outside the box like that. And, and oh my goodness, if if employers could get together almost collectively and think about that, you know, it's kind of like, it, it's amazing to us, our age, to think about the fact that there weren't 401ks years ago. You know, That's true. Those weren't around. And finally, people got together and said, we well, need to all have savings. Let's do a 401k. Well, it, it's similar to that. If everyone got together and realized, let's do something to help our employees be prepared. be prepared to take care of, take care of loosely of their aging parents. If that happened, it would just make all the employees more productive in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it gives them less things to worry about. Yes. I always advocate for um, on-site <clears throat> um, care for mm -hmm. children and or adults, uh -huh. especially because if you've got younger children and a parent you know, that's got early onset Alzheimer's like my mom did and you put them together, it's like pseudo grandparents and some of mm. them can help kids by, you know, reading to them or with um, them or the kids read to the quote unquote grandmas yep. or the, you know, the grandpas are playing catch with them or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm pulling out sexist tropes here, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> there was you, my, well, one, it makes the adult, it makes the older adult, the aging parent feel useful. Yeah. It, and what the they're, yeah, exactly. There right. was a um, in my old hometown was an adult day program where they brought the preschool children in in the morning and they interacted with the older adults for about an hour. Mm -hmm. And then in the afternoon, the elementary school age children, they basically did the same thing. But some of those people were still able to give a little bit of homework help. Sure. And they were yeah. serious pseudo grandparents. And then so you think, oh, this is really great. This is benefiting, you know, the younger generation and the older generation. But what was really obvious when you talked to the director of the of the center is how much it benefited that poor sandwich caregiver mm, because absolutely. the kids were getting benefits. The older adult was getting mm -hmm. benefits, you know, in the immediate moment. And that, you know, that sandwich caregiver, generally a mom, they were getting benefits, too, and they weren't even present. And I was like, why do more employers not do this? Because it, to me. It would it would make so much more sense. Like if your kid gets hurt, you're pretty close. If mom gets hurt or dad, you know, some medical emergency, you're close. You know, you might be able to handle things and like, OK, the crisis is, you know, it's handled. It's over. And then you can have the decision. Do I go to the hospital with him? Do I need to leave for the day or can I go back and wrap up what I was doing? It just it, I think it gives you options. And like Mike was saying, it helps you think out of the box. So. We have a serious caregiving crisis in this country, both for children and older adults. So we mm -hmm. need, we start need we need to have get marches creative. in the street for this thing. Yeah, for it's real. Cre get creative. And I do wonder if because of COVID and the the requirement, or that people had to employers had to be so flexible with people's work environment because they were homeschooling from home, or maybe did have parents that were living with them. I do think that many many employers are much more flexible now. So that you don't necessarily have to be in the office five days a week. And I mean, frankly, neither of our kids are even in the office at all yet, you know, still. And so I think that there, I think maybe that having people working from home might have really kind of helped set the groundwork for being able to have some more flexibility with people's work schedules so that if they need to take off in the middle of the day to run mom to a doctor's appointment or things like that, that that's going to be more accepted. Mm -hmm. I hope then so. it was, oh, I've got to take a half day off or I've got to ask, you know, ask for permission to be able to to take take time off work and leave the office, if that makes sense. Oh, totally. I mean, I, I don't know why we decided that one has to work, you know, eight hours with maybe a half an hour or an hour in the middle of two four hour shifts, so to speak, to be productive. Like I'm I am not that productive first thing in the morning. I got to have my tea and my workout and then I get going. And then by three or four o'clock, you know, it might be a good time to have taken my mom mm -hmm. to the park to watch children and maybe answer some emails on my phone and then maybe have a 
light, you know, afternoon tea would be nice. And then go back and do a couple hours of work or do a couple hours of work after dinner. Yeah. But yeah, I don't understand. And I, I do think it's changing. I don't think the younger generations, gosh, that makes me sound old. I don't think they're going to put up with it. And just on a completely flip mm -hmm. side of the coin is I think we would be doing our entire globe and population favors if we encouraged more people to have a more balanced work and home life by working from home when ne when possible, going into the office when absolutely necessary, because you know now we're not driving as much, polluting the air, we're not spending time on the road. You know, I am in California. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. you want to talk about getting into San Francisco? No, thank you. Right. Um, How badly do I, I want to go? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for real. Um, you know, and it's just, it's like, even if you're lucky enough that it's one hour each way, that's two hours a day, you mm -hmm. know, 10 hours a week, challenging my brain with some math here. <laughs> 10 hours is a, <laughs> that's a whole work day where you could right. be maybe taking care of an aging parent, dealing with your children, you know, whatever, dealing with the dog that's napping on my couch, you know, because she didn't get a walk because living in the Sierra foothills, it rains more and I don't like it. <laughs> like I said, I'm ready for the, the uh, spring version of this week to happen weather, weather wise, <laughs> but yeah. So where can people find your group? And then we didn't even touch on your caregivers key workbook. So we better do that pretty quick before this sure. gets into a two hour episode. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. The, the easiest place to go to find us is just to go to parentingagingparents.com. That's our website. There are dozens of interviews with experts that you can see what topics you might be interested in, as well as there's buttons on every page that say join the community. And that's how you can join the Facebook group. It'll take you right to the Facebook group. Yeah. And this is what our caregivers key looks like. The, uh, the, I guess you could say the physical version. We also have a digital version as well, but you know, we created that mainly because there's so many things in here from, from health and insurance and, and your financial situation and passwords, you know, uh, all stuff about housing, just things that you need to know about mom and dad. Just so when that crisis happens, you know, if you don't know their neighbor's to, name or yeah, well, well, you don't know what their doctor's name is, or you don't know where their insurance is, or you don't know where their will is located or their power of attorney is located or something as silly as passwords. You know, it, I, we love to compare it to if mom and dad are still living at home and dad pays the bills all the time. He goes into the hospital how does he get the bills? Oh, is it via email? How do you get into his email? Mm -hmm. If you know if he's not there, can you get into his email? If he pays everything online, can you get into his bank account and pay things online? If not, oh my goodness, you're stuck. Well, if you have all the information in the caregiver's key, mm -hmm. it helps tremendously. You know, technology, having all the mobile phone and the cable and the computer passwords and stuff like that, social media, transportation, you know, the cars, where's the extra car keys? Mm -hmm. Who has those? Where are they located? What's the 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 alarm code at, at the house or in their apartment? So many things on there that you just don't think about it until it's too late. No, for sure. <clears throat> so car keys. Made me think of something. You'd probably should add to your little book there. How many neighbors have spare keys? Oh, yeah. That's right. Because, you yeah. know, if you take away the parent's car and the neighbor has spare keys, it might be in trouble or, mm -hmm. you know, house keys. I wouldn't assume the neighbors would do anything nefarious. But, you know, these are good things to know because sure. the neighbors got keys and you like we rented out my mom's house when she moved to memory care. And I mean, that could have just been weird. Maybe, I don't know. It just, that thought <laughs> popped into my head. So I'm like, yeah. there's, there's a thousand little tiny details of our daily lives. That, Going things. Right. And yeah. going through the list will often prompt even additional ideas. Like when you mentioned the, do you have the pin code for their account? You may know their account number and all of that, but do you actually know that four digit pin code that you need when you call certain, the bank or your cell phone provider. So, mm -hmm. you know, those little things, or just, or, you know, just to give you the ideas of questions that you might not have even thought to ask your parents, you know, do they have somebody who does their yard so that in case they are not able to be at home for a few weeks and we need to get the yard mode, you know, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So just the, so but many the, little things and so many really big things too. My mom and dad have been very prepared for years where I always had a copy of the will, power of attorney, medical directive. And years and years ago, it's probably 20 years ago, they bought where they're going to be buried. They bought the coffin. Everything is done. But then I started talking to my, after we moved my mom into memory care, I was up there visiting. I was talking to dad at lunch and I said, you know, we've never talked about the fact, have y'all even considered about what's going to happen at your funeral? 
Do you have a favorite Bible verse that you want said? Do you have a favorite song mm. that you want? Do you know who you want to speak? Anything like that. And he's like, no, we've never talked about that. I said, well, here, let me give you just a <laughs> copy of this. And just, <laughs> you don't, I don't think you're dying tomorrow. So just write it down at your convenience when it pops into your head. But it's, again, it's stuff like that to where when that crisis happens, you're, you're a little bit more prepared because again, it's still going to be a crisis no matter what it is. But if you're more prepared, it lessens the, the, the attack, the hit that you're going to yeah, take. Definitely. Well, this has been fantastic. The, um, parenting your aging parent.com is linked in the episode notes. So you guys don't even have to remember <laughs> what that was. And I would That's definitely it. check it out. And I appreciate Kim and Mike's conversation today. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, we really appreciate it. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.